Well, we're studying the book of Ezekiel, and we have a very unusual chapter tonight. I'll try to give a little bit of background. We are in chapter 28, and uh, many people, many Christians are, dis- are shocked to discover there are other chapters besides 38 and 39 in Ezekiel. Well, other people will be surprised, uh, are aware of chapter 28, and they don't know any other chapters. For a lot of other, this is a very unusual chapter we're jumping into tonight. But if you recall the outline of Ezekiel, the first three chapters was the call of the prophet. And then the next 21 chapters were God's judgment on Jerusalem. And that was given before the, the final siege. The first capture was Daniel and his friends that were taken as hostages. Then the next siege was when Ezekiel was taken, again as a captive. But uh, he warned them, if they don't behave and recognize that Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument of judgment, Jerusalem would be leveled. They wouldn't listen. They were. But be- the, so the, those 24 chapters are before that final siege of Jerusalem. Chapters 25 and 32 are then given during that siege, and the subject changes. It's God's judgment. Not on Jerusalem now. That's done. We've been through those 24 chapters. Then we're in this group of chapters where God is judging the nations, and we'll discover, especially in the subsequent ones, that these nations have something in common. They're Muslim. That's given during the siege. And once we get through this section, we then will get to the upbeat part of the whole book, the restoration of the Jews. That's given after the siege, of course. The return to their land, the Valley of Dry Bones, and of course the Gog and Magog thing that everybody's talking about these days. And then from 40 to 48, the Millennial Kingdom... And it's interesting to discover, and you'll see why, there's probably one Christian in ten that has any idea what he prays for when he says, Thy kingdom come. The Lord's Prayer. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get into all of that in chapter 40 and following. But we're in this section um, during the siege where our focus is are the Gentile nations. Okay? Why is the Lord bringing judgment on Israel's foes? For two reasons. Their demeanor towards Israel, of course, that's one of the reasons, but also because of their ungodly pride and self-deification. And that's going to be exemplified in the extreme in this chapter in a way that may not surprise most of you, but I think some of you may be surprised. Judgment on the nations. We had the first four in that chapter 25, and then we last time we got into the subject of Tyre. And uh, we're going to get before the night's over through Sidon, a brief one, and that will for next session, prepare us for the wrap-up of this section with Egypt and so on. So chapter 25 dealt with those first four. And then last time we took Tyre, chapters 26 and 27, and we touched on chapter 28. We'll review that part tonight, because tonight we're going to get into a, a piece of chapter 28 that is about Tyre, and yet it's not about Tyre. And we'll take a look at that. Chapter, verses 11 through 19 may come as a surprise to many of you. It's about Satan, his origin, his career, and his destiny. And uh, then, of course, we'll wrap up with the Sidon thing, and that'll take care of us this evening. And next time, of course, we'll enter a four-chapter series on Egypt. And in that, we're going to learn some surprising things about all of these that uh, we'll defer until then. But uh, Tyre... We started that last time, but tonight we're going to get into chapter, verses 11 through 19. It actually, in Hebrew, it's Zor, it means the rock city, and it refers to the island Tyre. There's a mainland and an island part of this on the mainland. They're about a half a mile apart. New Tyre, a century and a half before the fall of Jerusalem, had successfully resisted the Assyrians for five years who tried to besiege it and didn't get very far, according to Josephus. Nebuchadnezzar took a shot at it, and he spent 13 years trying to seal it off. And why couldn't he get at it? Because their navy could feed the island, and he had no way to get at them. All he could deal with was the mainland part of the, of the empire. And uh, so it was a, this was the capital of a huge worldwide commercial enterprise, the, the, the uh, Phoenician Empire. And they went far beyond the Mediterranean. Many people don't realize that beyond the pillars of Hercules, Rock of Gibraltar, all that, all the way to Great Britain, and maybe even North and South America, believe it or not. And uh, we talked a little bit about that last time. And uh, they established a colony, and of course, North Africa. They had great colonies all over. And so, uh, so because of this, Tyre was a very proud city. Hiram was the king of Tyre, and he was a, had a very close friendship with David. 
And um, so when David dies, Solomon and Hiram didn't get along quite that well because they were primarily a commercial competitor with Israel. Israel had the land routes, uh, Tyre had the sea routes, and they competed for, tra for traffic and were, in effect, more competitors than helpers. But Hiram was quite a king, but he also was, that was the center of Baal worship, and that gets exported to Israel through Jezebel, among others. And uh, that whole business with Ahab, uh, it, it starts the decline, uh, accelerates the decline of the, of, of the nation Israel. But see, both Tyre and Jerusalem vied for the lucrative trade routes, and uh, so uh, th that made them competitors. And so that's why when Jerusalem seemed to be getting in trouble, Tyre celebrated the fact that Jerusalem's getting in trouble. Big mistake. Big mistake. Just a few verses from last time to get the flavor of it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and I will cause many nations to come up against thee. Many nations come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And so the, the island nature, the rocky part of it, is about 142 acres, and we talked about that last time. And so, O Tyrus. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers, and I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Fishermen like a, a bare rock with no bushes to dry their nets. That's sort of the imagery that's going on here. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar came up against the city and destroyed the city, but he's talking about the mainland, not the island part of it. He didn't scrape it. This is fulfilled in part by Nebuchadnezzar, but not completely because there's something else that comes along. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, and I've spoken it, saith the Lord God, it shall become a spoil to the nations. God predicts that it will be a fishing village, not a big commercial capital, and that is what it is today. That is what it is today, interestingly enough. So Tyre's gloating over Jerusalem was very short-lived. The king who destroyed Jerusalem would also attack Tyre for 13 years. And so, um, uh, until the mainland part of it was destroyed. And Tyre could hold out because they had a very effective navy, a worldwide navy, supporting their, their island uh, part of it. So Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the mainland Tyre, but not this island stronghold. Alexander the Great comes along some years later. He devastated the city when it refused to submit to his advancing forces. He destroyed the mainland city, and then he didn't stop there. In apparently seven months, his army took the rubble from the destroyed city in the mainland and dumped it in the ocean and built a causeway that's now world famous so that his army could go and take the island, and they did. And they slaughtered him, cleaned it up. That is now, the whole thing is now an isthmus if you visit there, but it was really uh, derived from the causeway that Alexander is famous for doing. And as the scripture says, he took stones, timber, and the rubbish of old Tyre, and he built this causeway to new Tyre uh, on the island, and he, so he took it. So the, Tyre is the great commercial center. In some respects, the, the language is very parallel to Tyre and it, to Babylon in the New Testament. Both Isaiah and the New Testament talk about Babylon in those terms. So there's some interesting parallels. We've got to be cautious about parables. You can, parallels, you can go too far. But the parallelism is, that is the Jewish mind, by the way. Hermeneutical comment. You and I think of prophecy as a prediction and as a fulfillment. Prediction and its fulfillment. That's the Greek or Gentile model. The Jewish model is that prophecy is pattern. They study patterns. And uh, so the pattern of Tyre, the pattern of Babylon, and the pattern of what's mystery Babylon may be parallel, not necessarily identical. So just be sensitive to that. Babylon, not Tyre, will apparently be the capital of the Antichrist from, because of other passages. We won't get into all that here. But I want you to as you go through all of these things, be sensitive to the insanity of prosperity. It's interesting as you read the book of Proverbs, especially Proverbs 30, where the writer there, Solomon, says, I don't want to be poor, I don't want to be rich. Don't let me be poor because I don't want to steal, lest I, I take your name in vain, be a bad witness. I don't want to be rich, lest I forget thee and take you for granted. In other words, you want to be, he, he pleads to be in the middle. I don't want to be rich or poor, I want to be in the middle. Interesting insight. The insanity of prosperity. There are all kind of, besides Tyre, there are other instances. Sennacherib in 2 Kings 17. Pharaoh of Egypt. We'll talk about that uh, in the next session. Nebuchadnezzar got into a pride trip. In fact, he, as a result of that, wrote a chapter in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. Herod gets into a big pride trip in Acts 12. The man of sin, one of the titles of the Antichrist, is on a, he's on a real ego trip. 
And conquerors in general that rely on their weapons end up sooner or later stumbling. All of us today who worship the goddess of getting ahead run the risk of forgetting who our benefactor really is. We should pray every day for protection against the sin of presumption and the sin of ingratitude. That traps us all. That traps us all. Well, let's jump right into 28, which is the primary subject for tonight. The power behind the throne. We spent a whole uh, uh, couple of chapters here before on Tyre, the city, and the empire. 28 sounds like the same thing, but we're going to look more carefully. It's talking about people. Two different people. The prince of Tyre, and then subsequently the king of Tyre. We're going to try to understand what is the writer, what is God really saying to whom? The power behind the throne. So Ezekiel jumps in again, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man. Now notice, by the way, Ezekiel always says this to underscore, these are not his opinions. When you hear me sound off, you know, I just chuck Mr.'s opinion. And I hope you take that with a grain of salt at best. Okay. Ezekiel isn't giving Ezekiel's opinion. He is communicating what the Lord said to him, told him to communicate. The Lord is saying, Son of man, Say unto the prince of Tyrus, the prince of Tyrus, the word is Nagid, it's, a, it's not the king, that's Melech, it's Nagid, it's the, the, the topmost guy, but not necessarily the supermost guy. Say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. See his mistake? Pride is at the root here, isn't it? God hates pride, and we'll learn why before the night's over. But that's why leaven is always a symbol of sin. Because leaven corrupts by puffing up. And that's exactly what sin does, and pride does. The prince of Tyrus, and I want you to be sensitive to that title. Thou art a man. This guy is a man. We're going to talk about someone a little bit that's not a man. He's more than that. I want you to sensitize the change in language that's going to occur when we get to verse 11. But here he says, I'm a God. That's the same. We're going to later, later this, e uh, this evening, we're going to take a look at Isaiah 14, where Isaiah uses the same kind of language for not Tyre, but the king of Babylon. Just be alert to that. It will uh, be coming. There are similar examples of people who thought they were God, you know. The boast of Pharaoh Hophra in, in uh, uh, Ezekiel 29. We'll get to that next time. The praise given to Herod Agrippa by the Tyrians. Paul's description of the Antichrist. He calls him the man of sin there in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. It's almost the same words here. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, speaking of the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above what? All that is called God. That includes Allah, by the way. All that is called God, or that is worshipped. This isn't a Catholic thing. This isn't a Muslim thing. It's not a Hindu thing. It's all of the above in one big meatball. Of all that is called God, or that is worshipped. Boy, that's a lot. This guy is, this guy is the, ult, the ultimate ego. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the abomination of desolation. That's tied to that. We won't get into that whole thing. Just be aware of it. He says, I sit in the seat of God in the Ezekiel passage. See, Tyre was known, by the way, as the holy island. Very powerful, obviously. The city was thought of as rising from its waters like a rock throne of God. We find that in the, ancient, you know, the, the perception of the ancient writers. Thou, though thou set thy heart. See, the words remind us here, as you hear these echoes, of Genesis 3. Satan's, you know, uh, uh, seducing Eve. Continuing in Ezekiel 28. Behold, thou art wiser than, uh, you think you are, you, but thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Interesting reference here. Daniel was not near Ezekiel. He's out in the country. Daniel's in the court of Babylon, but well known, obviously. And he's using him here as a benchmark. You think you're wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches. 
and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Riches are dangerous. Because you're wealthy, you think you know. There's only one barrier, one certain barrier to truth. And that's the presumption you already have it. With that presumption, you don't look any further, and you're not open to correction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, ooh, that's strong language. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Bad news, eh? They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. So he's speaking to seafaring people, so he uses seafaring idioms here. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. You think you're a God, that's going to not be impressive, the guy is cutting your head off. <laughs> Ethbaal III was removed from his throne by Nebuchadnezzar in about 573 B.C., which is the illusion here. An actual guy on a big ego trip, God predicts, and he gets clobbered. Okay? Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised. You may not realize what that means. The Phoenicians were Gentiles, but they practiced circumcision. Herodotus tells us about that. But the Babylonians did not practice circumcision, and it's the Babylonians that end up clobbering Tyre. So indeed, they died at the hands of the uncircumcised, which, which, which was to them ignominious. It wasn't only Israel that circumcised. So they were, to, they were to die at the hands of the uncircumcised. They didn't mess around. When they, when they had a siege and they brought the siege, they slaughtered. They either sold the men into slavery, took the women into slavery, or, or you know, killed them. And sometimes the lucky ones were the ones that were killed. But the power behind the throne is our subject coming up here. We, the earlier 11 verses talked about the prince of Tyre. The word there in the Hebrew is Nagid, which means the man at the top. And Ezekiel prophesied against the whole city. Now he's singling out the city's leader for a special word. He's not using the prince of Tyre. He's, you know, that, that, that prince was Ethel the third, I mentioned. From verse 11 on, we're going to talk about the king of Tyre. He's using a different phrase. He's using the word Melech, which is a... A different word in the Hebrew, obviously. So let's take a look at verse 11 and following it. I want you to be sensitive to the fact that something, someone just shifted gears. The idioms here are going to be more expansive than what's gone on up till now. Let's be sensitive to it. Ezekiel says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Different word. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. Now watch what he says here, and you'll quickly discover this can't be a normal human being. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. It doesn't say he claims that. It says that he is. He's what? He sealeth up the sum, full, he's the king of Tyre. He is the epitome of wisdom. He's complete or perfect in his beauty. This isn't a false claim of his, like the previous passage implied. This is his, apparently, this apparently, at least at the moment, appears to be true. Remember the word prince was, uh, it, you may remember Ezekiel used that of Zedekiah very spring. He never called Zedekiah king. He, he called him a nakid, a prince. And... Uh, and as I say, the king of Tyre was, was taken, uh, who had taken part uh, with the pharaoh of Egypt in their league against Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar set both of their clocks before it's all over, okay? The language here, though primarily applied to the king of Tyre, is similar to the language that we're going to see God use against the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. We'll look at that before we're through this evening. So what's really in view here is something much deeper much broader, more complete than just the idiom 
through which they're talking. And of course, it includes a lot of things, including the Antichrist and the rest of it. Let's continue with Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Really? Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. Thy workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Verse 13 is a very pregnant verse. There's a lot in here. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. There are some commentators here, well, he's just speaking idiomatically. He couldn't have really, literally been in Eden. I don't think so. I think that is what he's saying. Thou hast, I, I believe God means what he says and says what he means. And the person he's talking to isn't the king sitting on the throne of Tyre right now. It's the power behind him. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. It's interesting how God always speaks of Satan indirectly. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Is he talking to Peter? No, he's talking to the power that prompted that thought. And we'll see other examples of that before through today. Okay, now, now we get this description here that's pretty bizarre. You know, he, he, he's, what, what's he wearing? Is he wearing fancy garments of silk or gold? No. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. I personally suspect that that is an idiomatic way of speaking that he's clothed with light. Those are the colors involved. That's their way of representing a prism or light or what have you. You follow me? And let's take a look at this. The stones that he's talking about are the stones that are on the breastplate of the high priest. They're on the breastplate of the high priest and they're also come up in the book of Revelation in terms of the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. Now the first one and the last one are, they're in an order. Each one is for one of the twelve tribes of Israel, okay? The first one is a sardius. It represents Reuben, whose name means, Behold a son. And the last one is a jasper, which speaks of Benjamin, the son of my right hand. So behold the son, so together they're all inclusive. Okay, if you, when, you, when you're in the book of Exodus or, or book of Deuteronomy or, getting, or Leviticus getting into all this, you're familiar with all the, you know, the, the breastplate and so forth. And on each stone is engraved, it's hard to see in this photograph, but on each stone is engraved the, the two or three letters that represent that tribe, the root for the tribe. So the twelve tribes are identified by these twelve. Everything in God's kingdom is twelves. Correction. Everything in God's kingdom is sevens. Seven churches and so on and so forth. Everything in the kingdom of heaven is twelves. There are twelve tribes. There are twelve apostles that will rule over the twelve tribes. There are twelve kingdom parables. There's twelve kingdom mysteries. There are twelve thousand of each of the twelve tribes sealed in Revelation 7. The foundation, the, 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 the New Jerusalem is twelve thousand by twelve thousand by twelve. Twelve, twelve, twelve everywhere for the kingdom from heaven. Okay? So, okay. Now it's interesting that nine of these are listed in the Masoretic rendering of the Ezekiel passage. So the nine precious stones answer to nine of the twelve. What most people don't realize is the three that are missing in the third row are omitted in the Masoretic text, but we find them, interestingly enough, in the Septuagint and in the Latin Vulgate. So we suspect that they somehow got dropped or copies missed or some, that in the original, bear in mind the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament is 900 years earlier than the Masoretic text. That's nine, see, it's 9th century A.D. And we're also going to be treated when Peter Flint comes uh, to, to, to the Great Isaiah Scroll, who he's translating it for us. And so, because uh, that's even, that's 1,200 years earlier yet, so it's kind of fun. Anyway, uh, so that's that little bit. It's interesting how Paul also gives an illusion that we don't usually think about with respect to Satan. All of us are victims of old English literature images that come from the occult. I love the way John Leffler points out, he has a little thing, he says, Satan does not wear tights. He's not wearing red tights, carrying a bitch fork, and ruling hell. No, he's not ruling hell, he's going to be incarcerated there. No, those, a lot of those idioms that we think of are from literature, and Satan's whole strategy is to get you to either d uh, doubt that he even exists, on the one hand, or that you'd be terrified that he can intimidate you. 
You want to be between those two. You want to understand He is real, He does exist, but you have authority in Christ if you're in Christ. Make sure you leave it to Christ to deal with it. But Paul makes a, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, For such, he's speaking of false teachers, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Boy, do you see that? that? You can see that on the airwaves. People who call themselves Christians. And doing all kinds of non-biblical practices. But let's move on. And Paul says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. Satan is not ugly. If he was ugly, you'd be repelled by him. No, he's attractive. And his man on the planet Earth is going to be the most attractive leader the world's ever seen when he shows up. Satan himself is an angel of light that, that captures the flavor of Ezekiel 28 that we just read. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Just because they proclaim that they're Christians is what they're selling you biblical? Key question. Angel of light. Well, let's get back to verse 13. Thou hast been in the Eden, been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and gold. The work, now there's another thing here. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Key point. He is a, as powerful as he is, he is a created being. I called, did a great book many years ago called Between Christ and Satan. The book isn't bad, the title's terrible. The book's pretty good actually, but the tragedy is the title, because the title creates the impression that the conflict is between Christ and Satan. You've got to be kidding. Christ created him. Christ can snuff him out anytime he felt like it. He serves a purpose at the moment, strangely enough. So don't, 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 don't fall into the trap of assuming some kind of equivalence between the two. Hardly. Hardly, hardly, hardly. The tabrets is some kind of musical instrument, probably somehow akin to what we think of a tabourine. The pipes, literally, the word really means the holes in, in a flute. These two terms seem to indicate that among his skills is music. Now some of you have suspected that from the kind of music that's around these days. <laughs> But this is where some people get the impression, but it's a conjecture, that among his duties he may have led worship in heaven. Because he apparently has musical skills. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. And apparently he was an incredible musician or singer or whatever. That's, that seems to be. There are other constructions from the Hebrew possible, but I don't want to waste our time on all that. Then we get to verse 14, which gives us another key insight here. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That is one of those places where the old English may not communicate to us as effectively as we might have it. Thou art the anointed cherub. That, what is a cherub? A cherub is some kind of super angel. We find them in the Garden of Eden, guarding the way. We find them on the ark, uh, emblazoned on the Ark of the Covenant. God is said to be the one that dwells between the cherubim, meaning the Ark of the Co Covenant model, if you will. Um, we find uh, these, these, these uh, super angels, called cherubim is the plural, um, uh, a cherub, it's got nothing to do with Renaissance art. You know, there's an idiom of cherubs in art that's got nothing to do with the biblical cherub. The biblical cherub wasn't a little pudgy, winged idiom, whatever. No, a, a cherub was powerful, terrifying, and their primary job seems to be to guard the deity of God. So they surround his throne. And you have angels and you've got cherubs, cherubim, cherubim being the plural. Uh, uh, sometimes in the English you'll even say cherubim's plural. It's a, that's a real mixed metaphor. Cherubim is, cherub is singular, cherubim is plural, right? Anyway, this guy was the anointed cherub that covereth. That's a funny, a strange way of saying it perhaps, but that's the old English way of saying he was in charge. He was on top. The other cherubs, cherubim, reported to him. He apparently was numero uno within the created structure. 
He's still a created being, but very probably the most powerful one. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That's a very key word. And I have set thee so, God says. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, whatever that is. Okay. Super angels. We find them in Isaiah 6. We, we encountered them already in, a, in Ezekiel 1 and 10, if you may recall. And they show up very conspicuously in Revelation 4 and 5. Right after the churches were in heaven, and the cherubim are major players there. Okay. Then he goes on and says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Underscore that part. He is a, as powerful as he is, he is a created being. That means he's not forever. Okay? Created being. Till iniquity was found in thee. This is the beginning. This is the source of sin. And we'll find out why and where when we get to Isaiah here in a minute. Who was the one that created Satan? Who did it? Jesus did. Colossians 1.16 By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the Creator. The fact that He became incarnate, don't let that diminish the fact that He's the guy that in six days created the universe. Maybe. We'll get to that too. But thou wast created till. One of these days I'm going to make an inventory of all the untils in the Scripture. That's always a key milestone. Until. Major mouse, until iniquity is found in thee. So anyway, Satan, even with all his power, is still a created being. Till iniquity was found in thee. You know, it's interesting, Ezekiel here is describing the king of Tyre in terms that could not possibly apply to a man. This so-called king had appeared in the Garden of Eden in verse 13, had been a, the guardian cherub of the throne of God in, ver, in, chapter, in verse 14. He possessed free access to God's holy mountain in verse 14. He had been sinless from the time he was created. He enjoyed sinless durability for a while until sin was found in him. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's keep here going on here. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the most of thee, midst of thee, with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So he's going to get expelled. I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. In Job we find him before the throne of God accusing Job. So he apparently, that's where he gets his title. Hasatan is the Hebrew. The accuser. But he's going to be driven out of the place of sanctity, according to this verse, two verses before, which he had occupied. Psalm 89 deals with that also, by the way. So we're dealing with Satan, Hasatan in the Hebrew. His origin, his agenda, and his destiny. We can't possibly summarize it in just a few words, but we'll, we'll take a quick look at it. The origin and career. It's interesting that we see him usually addressed indirectly. In Genesis chapter 3, when God declares war on him, he addresses the serpent that he happens to be indwelling. In Isaiah 14, we're going to see him addressed through the king of Babylon, just like Ezekiel deals with him through the king of, the king of Tyre. We'll get to that in a minute. In Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Peter made an improper conclusion. Jesus ascribes it, not to Peter, but to the power that prompted that behind him. So he's addressing him, you know, indirectly. So he's our accuser. In Job 1, of course, he has access to the whole, the whole scenario of the book of Job, all 42 chapters, deals with issues that Job didn't know. You're treated to chapter 1 with the, the little, um, I was going to call it a wager or a bet or a dare between God and Satan. Have you considered Job? And that whole dialogue, which sets the stage, Job didn't know anything about that. <laughs> he was just the victim, so to speak. So, interesting. And of course, he's also the tempter. Not just an accuser, he's also a tempter. And uh, 
You know, if anybody knows Flip Wilson knows it. The devil made me do it, right? Okay, he's the tempter. Luke chapter 4 is one of the classic passages. We won't go through the three temptations. Chapter 4, verse, first dozen verses, we'll deal with it. Let's just pick one of these, though, because it's very instructive. The second of the three, according to the Luke account. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 says, And the devil, taking Jesus up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. How did he do that? I don't know. Did he do it? Absolutely. It says so. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. Wow. Let's hang on a second here. Let's realize that this was a temptation of Christ. If I offered to sell you the entire Coeur d'Alene Resort, got a deed here, would you be tempted to give me a few thousand dollars for that? I don't think so. Because you have sufficient reason to doubt my ownership of that. That's only a temptation if you believe I own it. If I really do own it, which I don't obviously, but if I, if I really did own it, you know, that Mr. Hagedorn sold it to me a few weeks ago, and I now have it on this piece of paper. In order for you to be tempted, you have to believe I own it. Jesus does not challenge the veracity of what he's saying here. The devil said to him, all this power, he shows them the kingdoms of the world somehow. All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. That's a meaningless temptation, unless he really does have it delivered to him, and he can deliver it to whomever he will. Then it is a temptation. And he's saying to Christ, if thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. All three temptations, by the way, typically involve a misquote of the Bible by Satan that Jesus answers by quoting things properly. Anyway, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Period. Carriage return. New subject. Done. Done deal. But let's not fail to understand what this communicates. Not only was Jesus successful at not succumbing to that, there are three temptations involved, you can study that in Luke 4 at your leisure. But the interesting one here to realize is that Satan laid claim to the world. It's his. If the world is messed up, if the world seems hostile to things of, of the church, if things are, seems hostile to things of God, if things seem hostile to Israel, don't be surprised. Who's in charge? The usurper. The usurper. And the usurper is going to get his due. When you study the book of Joshua, you find Joshua is facing a usurper. Ten nations. Three were already put down. Seven left. And the first thing he does, he sends in two witnesses. And then, uh, you know, they have the seven trumpets and all that, and the, uh, the, the capital of the Amorites falls. Then the nations that are left ally themselves under a leader called Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. And he's defeated in the battle of Beth Horon with signs of the sun and the moon. Even the days weren't long enough for Joshua's battle, so the days get a little longer to, to suits his purposes. <laughs> and, the, and the kings then finally say, hide in caves, and say, rocks fall on us. And as you read the book of Joshua, if you've read the book of Revelation, you say, gee, this sounds awfully familiar. And you suddenly realize the book of Joshua is a miniature model of the book of Revelation in dozens of ways, with the decimal point moved over. Okay? And so it's interesting. Again, the planet Earth is going to be dispossessed of a usurper. And that's what Christ is all about. But here we have an offer by the owner. The Lord rejected Satan's offer, but not because he didn't recognize the ownership, because he knew that Satan did have those kingdoms. Ultimately, Christ will rule over the kingdom of the world, but not as the vice region of Satan. But today we need to understand the devil is still the prince of the power of the air, and he's the one that is in the back of the kingdoms of our world, whether we recognize it or not. 
You have a summary of this whole scenario in Revelation 12. Every once in a while the book of Revelation pauses and gives you sort of an overview. And that's what happens in Revelation 12. We have the woman. Well, who is the woman? You know, she, uh, she's associated with the sun, the moon, and twelve stars. Which if you remember your, your Torah, you know that is, that's an idiom of Israel. And she's with child. Well, the woman's a church. If she's the church, she's in bad company. She's pregnant. And I thought the church was the virgin bride. See, the idioms are not commingling. No, this is Israel in the sense that it's through her that the Messiah would be brought forth. And who's tried to obstruct all of this from the beginning? A guy by the, that's a red dragon who has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. He attempts to devour the man-child when born. However, the man-child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who is the man-child? Jesus Christ, so identified all through the Psalms and New Testament. He is caught up to God in His throne. I think it was G.H. Pember that first suggested the possibility that that isn't the ascension alone, it's also the harpazo, lumped together. Interesting point of view, very provocative, we'll move on. At that point, the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. Interesting period of time, three and a half years. It's the great tribulation, the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. Michael and his angels get in to fight the dragon as angels. Michael is an angel. Michael is going to take on this red dragon. And the dragon is cast to the earth. He persecutes the woman for how long? Three and a half years. 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months. Those terms are used in the Old Testament and the New Testament to talk about this period. Well, who are these people? Well, the woman is clearly Israel, if you understand. Jacob himself ed, in, ed, explains that when Joseph has his dreams with the sun, moon, and twelve stars. And who is the red dragon? Verse 9 of chapter 12 nails it for you. It's the serpent, the devil, Satan, Hasatan. And the man-child, of course, is the kinsman redeemer that will rule all the nations around of iron. Little summary right there. Where is Satan's whereabouts? Well, God expelled him from the Mount of God. There's some ambiguity among scholars. Has that already happened? Is it part of the end time scenario? There's some different points of view. He was cast from God's government in heaven for sure, but he's still allowed access apparently because of Job chapter 1, Zechariah chapter 3. In the tribulation, Satan will be cast from heaven and restricted to the earth according to Revelation 12 that we just read. In the millennium, he will be chained in the bottomless pit. Some people say we're already in the millennium. There are people that really believe that. And if you run into one of them, say, if so, then Satan's chain, Satan's chain is too long. He's not, he's not. <laughs> After his brief release at the end of the thousand years, he will be cast in the lake of fire forever. That's what it was built for. That's what it's built for. Okay. Now, what are Satan's strategies? He's trying to thwart the will of God. We see that begin even in Genesis 6 with the corruption of Adam's line, which leads to the flood of Noah. It's a, it's a gene pool problem that's being, being dealt with. As God refines his plan prophetically, it allows Satan to focus his attack. After Genesis 12 and 17 and 20, Abraham's seed is going to be the key to the whole thing, so Abraham is singled out for, by Satan. And the fa famine in Genesis 50 and so forth. When you get to Exodus, the destruction of the male line by, uh, by uh, Pharaoh, is Satan's attempt to try to obstruct the messianic line. Doesn't work, because the bull rushes and all that. When, when, uh, even after the Passover, uh, when they, they flee, Pharaoh has a change of heart, chases them. He's still trying to wipe out Israel. And of course, his army drowns in the, in the, in the, the one of the great miracles. You know, experts say, well, just three and a half feet of water. Drown the whole Israel, Egyptian army in three and a half feet of water. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> the population of Canaan. In Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, in 400 years, your people are going to come back to this place. Well, Satan had his notepad. Oh boy, I've got four centuries to lay down a minefield. That leads to tribes, four of which Joshua was told to wipe out every man, woman, child of certain tribes. Why? Because of a gene pool problem. Again, part of Satan's strategy. In uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, speaks of those strange Nephilim then and also after that. It's a second in, uh, incursion. As God points out that it's all going to happen, not just through Abraham, but through the David, Davidic line, that allows Satan to focus attack on the line of David. And we see all through the scripture, Jehoram kills all his brothers, ah, except one. The Arabians threw all but Ahaziah. 
Athaliah kills all, but somehow misses Joash. And Hezekiah is assaulted and so forth, and there's a whole story there. Even in the book of Esther, the Persian Empire, Haman tries to wipe out all the Jews, and they're supernaturally protected by God invisibly behind the scenes. It continues in the New Testament. Joseph fears as his betrothed here is pregnant. That the punch for that was stoning. He's fierce for her, but for the intervention. Then Herod tries to wipe out all the babes in Bethlehem. That's Satan again trying to thwart the messianic line. At Nazareth, when he opens his ministry, the synagogue of Nazareth, they try to throw him off a cliff. Then we have these storms, there are two of them, they're storms at the sea, which I believe from the descriptions were not natural storms. We had experienced fishermen aboard that were terrified. These people knew the waters. They were terrified. I think those storms were something very special. Anyway, and then of course the ultimate one, the cross. The cross. What on earth were the bulls of Bashan that surround him in, Je in Psalm 22? Strange stuff. You would think that that would end it. Re Revelation 12 gives the opposite. He is not through yet. He's still after. Why is he still after us? I thought the cross settled it all. There's no prerequisite condition for the harpazo, the rapture. There is a prerequisite condition for the second coming of Christ. Several. One of which is Israel has to repent and request him to come back. That's Hosea, the last verse of Hosea 5, and then the following chapter 6 in Hosea lays it out. You're going to be interesting. So apparently Satan believes if he can wipe out the believing remnant, he wins. He's thwarted the plan of God. And uh, I've always, always wondered, why is he still at it? You would think it is a settled deal. Not in his mind. He thinks he can... That's why believers are singled out. Can you lose your salvation? No. Can you lose your productivity for the kingdom? Absolutely. He wants you to be unproductive. Because he wants to slow down that counter that's working against him. So he's still not through. He's still at it. And his specific target ultimately will be the believing Jew. The ones that will ultimately repent and seek his return. Let's move back to Ezekiel 28 and continues. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Oh, man. Thine heart was lifted up. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. <laughs> He's going to make an ash of himself. That's interesting. Okay. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Okay, that's the Ezekiel passage. We can't touch on this without looking at a parallel package out of Isaiah. This is not about Tyre. It's about Babylon. But the lamentation about the king of Babylon is very parallel to what we've just read in Ezekiel. Let's take a quick look at it. It's a very brief passage, but an important one. It starts about verse 12 of chapter 14. God says through Isaiah, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? This isn't about the literal king of Babylon. It's the power behind him. Again, that's the parallel, you see. Now here's the, here's the root problem all the way around. God speaking. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. The famous five I wills of his aspirations, not to be God, but to be like God. Many people miss that. He's trying to be God. No, he's trying to be like God. His aspirations alone indict him. Certainly they're futile, but the fact that he's aspiring to it is sin itself. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And the stars of God is another idiom for angels, by the way, the other angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Who we? Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol to be uh, to the sides of the pit. Boy, boy. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, say, Is this the person that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Can you, <laughs> see the, you can just see the disparagement as they behold his yielding here. We're going to see more of this when we get to Ezekiel 31 in another context. But anyway, now here's a strange verse that most people miss. Speaking of Satan, that made the world as a wilderness. When did he do that? Has he done that yet? I don't know. Has he done it once before? Maybe. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners? What on earth is this talking about? Nobody knows. I'm going to show you a possibility before we're through that may surprise you. That made the world as a wilderness that destroyed the cities thereof. We're going to look shortly at a passage in Jeremiah 4 that seems to echo the same thing. But let's, we're getting ahead of ourselves. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with the sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Ooh, boy. Graphic language. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, now, we're skipping a few verses down here now. Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land. Interesting word that many people overlook. The Antichrist does not come out of Western Europe. He is an Assyrian. And upon my mountains shall tread him underfoot, and they shall, his, his yoke shall depart from off of them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is, this is one of 33 titles of the Antichrist in the Old Testament. He has 13 different titles in the New Testament. But you'll find the Assyrian in Isaiah 10, in Micah 5, and Zephaniah 2, for starters. There's a whole study there. I don't have time to get into it here. just want to alert you to it. Continue, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath pur has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? No, God's in charge, ultimately. God is still ultimately in charge. Let's not forget that. The purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out about all the nations. Okay, let me introduce you with another concept that sort of is a close cousin of this one. And what I'm about to show you is very controversial. There are many really good scholars that would take exception to what I'm going to show you right now. So I don't want to oversell this, but I want you to be aware of it as a possibility. So I, I, in the issue of time, I want to go quickly. At the same time, I don't want you to think I, I don't want to railroad this thing. It's sometimes called the gap theory. It has to do with the possibility that there is an interval or a gap between the first two verses of Genesis. Okay? Some basic issues here. When were the angels created? Before the earth. Because the angels rejoiced to see the earth created. So they were created earlier than the earth. When did Satan fall? Nobody knows. By Genesis 3, he's already fallen, right? Is there a gap between the first two verses of Genesis? That's, that's the hypothesis. Read the book of Genesis, first five verses. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Those seven words, if you believe that verse, you'll have no problem with any other verse in the Bible. That says it all. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Paragraph. New subject. Okay. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved or brooded upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were day one. And I won't get through into all of that, that's our Genesis commentary, but I do want to focus on this second verse, because it impacts our perspective of everything we talked about tonight. The way you have it in your Bible, King James Bible, is, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay. The word was. Turns out, Haya, it's in the pluperfect form, it turns out. It really should say, had become. It's a transitive verb implying action. 
In Genesis 19, verse 26, that same verb is used when Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt. It's a transitive verb implying an action. The earth became, or had become, without form and void. Really? That's going to surprise us. Without form, the word is tohu, which, me, which means without form, uh, confused, and void, bohu, which means void, empty, or waste. Tohu vobohu in the Hebrew shows up several interesting places in the Old Testament. We're going to take a look at a few of those, okay? And the word and in front of all this is the vav conjunction. And is a conjunction, but there are different kinds of conjunctions, by the way. The vav conjunction can be adversative. In the Septuagint and in the Latin Vulgate, this is translated as an adversative, not and, but the earth became. Do you understand the difference? And this happened, okay. If I say, but this happened, it's adversarial. You follow me? It's, it's, it, there's a reversal somehow. And it's used that way all through the Scripture, by the way. There are a number of these. It also often suggests a significant time delay. There's an eight-year period in Exodus 2. There's a 38 period in Deuteronomy 10. There's a seven-year period in 1 Chronicles 12. There's a 58-year period in uh, uh, Ezekiel 6. By, uh, hinted at or alluded to by the, an adversative uh, conjunction. Okay. So we have the way this might be translated by some who would say it should be translated that way, but the earth became without form and void. Second verse, right off the bat. Something may have happened between verse 1 and verse 2 that isn't discussed here. What follows is a recreation as a result of a previous judgment. Darkness on the face of the deep. It's possible that Noah's flood was a second flood. There's an earlier one. Why? Well, we'll find out. There's several places where tohu vabohu show up in Isaiah 34, Isaiah 45, Jeremiah 4. Let's take a look at a couple of these. The one that's most interesting is Isaiah 45. You may recall this passage because it's part of God's letter to Cyrus that shows up in Isaiah 44 and 45. When you get to verse 18, God speaking in this letter to Cyrus says something very strange. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it. This is who's talking here. God that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This is a strange verse because it would seem to contradict Genesis 1 verse 2. He originally did not create it in vain, and yet in verse 2 we find the earth became tofu without form and void. So there are some scholars that make a big thing of that. That's what I want to alert you to. He created it not in vain. It would appear to, it's the same word, uh, without form, confused. In Jeremiah, different subject, in Jeremiah 4 we find something else. Jeremiah says something very strange. He says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Same phrase, tohu vabohu, out of Genesis 1 verse 2. It was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light? Really? Let's go in. This is the same thing, same word, tohu vabohu, without form and void. And he continues, he says, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. What on earth is Jeremiah talking about? It sounds like he's talking about some kind of judgment that is resulted in the Torah. It turns out the Torah of Abohu, when you follow through the Scripture, is almost always an echo of a judgment. So we get back to Genesis uh, uh, 1. But the earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness is an unnatural, it's not, it's not Lila Tov, like evening, a, a dark, saying good night to somebody, in Hebrew, Lila Tov, good, good night. No, it's Choshek, which is an unnatural darkness. In Exodus 10, verse 21, it's a darkness that you could feel. It's a judgment kind of darkness. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the word deep there in the Septuagint is the Abuso, the abyss the home of the demons and evil spirits and whatever else, who knows. Spooky stuff, tucked away right there in the second verse.
So this leads to, this, this, I've just shared with you a viewpoint that's controversial. It used to be, it was fashionable, it was first uh, suggested by uh, Thomas Chalmers in 1814, picked up by a number of authors, you'll even find it in the Schofield Bible, that's one of the things I grew up on, so it was early, I just, uh, enjoy, I still to this day enjoy it. Um, but the point is, it in recent years has become uncomfortable, so a lot of scholars try to hide this or bury it, they don't buy it. So. You, you, in your own studies, I think it deserves more research than is evident so far. We'll check into it. But uh, it's perhaps the, one of your best experts is George Pember, who wrote a book called Earth's Earliest Ages in 1907. And they're around. They're, uh, they're classics. I have them in my library. Another one, more con even more contemporary, is Donald Gray Barnhouse, who wrote a, a phenomenal book called The Invisible War. And it opens with this scene, if you will. Seeing the whole, he sees the whole conflict between God and Satan as starting back in those dark times and climaxing in the New Testament period. So his book, Arthur Custance, uh, Without Form and Void, he has a whole book on this from 1970. So there are these things around and there, there are other books written that try to refute it, so this is very controversial. But I'm reminded of Job when he gets his science quiz by God in Job 38. God says to Job, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? And whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, those are angels, shouted for joy. There's an illusion here. God is saying, where do you think you were? Were you around back then? You don't know. I do. See, that's sort of the, the flavor of all of that. Okay. We have just a quick wrap up here, and then we're through. We want to get, get, knock off Sa uh, Sidon for a few verses here. Uh, um, don't want to knock off Sidon. I just want to knock off the four verses. Sidon is a sister city of Tyre, and it has a, a few verses here at the very ten, tail end of this chapter. It's about 25 miles north of Tyre, founded by Canaan's firstborn in Genesis 10. The tribe of Asher did not drive out the Sidonians as he was instructed to do, and that's part of the legacy here. Uh, they later became subject to Tyre, was a Tyre group of power, powerfully, and it was destroyed by Esarhaddon in, in 677. It with Tyre became subject to the Pharaoh of Egypt in 588. And about the time of Solomon emerges, it was the headquarters of Baal worship, Ashtoreth and Tammuz and all those things. And it, was, and it, ha it has its own history. It, 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 Sidon it provided a cedar uh, for the rebuilding in the, under the days of Ezra, the temple. It was too, also destroyed by the Persians in the, in the fourth century um, and uh, surrendered to Alexander in the, the Great in 333. It all passed to the Romans in 64, and then uh, Jesus Christ made an interesting contrast about both Sidon and Tyre, saying that if, Tyre, if, Israel, if the works that Israel saw would have been seen by Tyre and Sidon, it would have turned them around, which is kind of an interesting indictment. It's an indictment of Israel, but an interesting allusion that Jesus makes there. Paul also touches at Sidon briefly. But anyway, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Set a man, set thy face against Sidon, and prophesy against it. And we know this today, it's Saida, by the way. I had a long discussion with a general, an Israeli general, about uh, Saida, and it took me a, 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 a while to realize that that's Sidon. We finally, uh, a lot suddenly became clear when we realized this question of pronunciation. Anyway, it became, of course, corrupt under the judges. And there are all kinds of other maledictions against Sidon and Joel and Zechariah and so forth. But anyway, say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Sidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. So it's about 20 miles from Tyre, and it was judged, but not destroyed. That city exists today. Tyre does not. This does. In the place where oil is typically uh, brought in from the Near East. I will send, her in, uh, uh, send into her pestilence and blood in the streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her at every side, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And there shall be no more traffic, a, a pricking briar in the house, unto the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So there, this, is, uh, this one little verse now shifts the focus back to Israel, if you will, and their restoration. But that, of course, is future, and that'll be really starting after we get through uh, the, the rest of the section, which is Egypt forthcoming. Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they were scattered, there's a diaspora alluded to here, by the way, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, they shall, then they shall dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. 
and they shall dwell safely therein, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I'm the Lord. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. And we'll talk more about that in the next few chapters. See, one reason so many say that God is through the nation of Israel because they haven't read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the Minor Prophets. All through these prophets, you get a totally different perspective. You get God's perspective of Israel. And the tragic biblical illiteracy of our current administration is frightening. The theme song of these prophets is that God is not through with Israel as a nation. And Paul hammers that in three chapters in the book of Romans, 9, 10, and 11, among other places. Okay, so we've been through these. We've just finished with Sidon. We finished Satan and Sidon. So next time we start a final group of chapters that finish this whole section of Judgment on the Nations. We're going to talk about Egypt. And so what I'd like you to do for the next time is to read chapters 29 through 32. We won't get them all in one session. And watch as you do that, be sensitive to some very subtle surprises. It sounds like, feels like, just a summary of judgment coming upon Egypt. But in those passages, there are some surprising uh, aspects of perspective that we'll attempt to deal with. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.